back. This is going to be a Berkeley advice video. I'm here with my friend Monique. Hello. And we're going to be talking about our experience as first years at Berkeley. Um, we're going to talk about tips and things we wish we knew. As you guys know, I'm a voice principal and Monique is a sax principal. We had very different experiences, but they were similar, obviously. So I think this will be good if you're watching this and you just want to know a little bit more what to expect. Um, this will be a two-part series. So I'll be answering some questions in this video and then we'll be answering some more questions on her channel on her video. So I'll leave a link for that down below and with all her socials so you can follow <laughs> her as well. But yeah, let's get into it. So the first question is how did you choose a roommate before you got to Boston and what was that experience like? Yeah, so I actually, this summer, well, I got accepted in April. So the spring slash summer before I got to Boston, I decided to get on the Berkeley Facebook page, which they will give you access to that and they'll create one for your class. And then everyone on there was posting intros of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I just was like scrolling and looking for people that were saying that they needed a roommate. And that's how I found my roommate, Tara. I liked on her bio that she like liked rom-coms and that she was a night owl. And so I saw that we had a few things in common. And so I reached out to her over Facebook and then we just kind of talked about our living situation and if we would gel living well together and it worked out and she became a roommate and it was like a great experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I chose her. So when I had the application, when they sent out the summer form for housing for fall, I put her as my roommate and she put me. Um, but that's how I found Tara. Cool. And then what questions did you ask her to see if you guys were a good fit for a roommate? Yeah. So I think a good question to ask is like, do they go to sleep early? Um, or are they like a night owl? Are they like a light or heavy sleeper? I know that was a big thing because um, I definitely am like a lighter sleeper and Tara is a heavier sleeper. We talked about boundaries in terms of like having guests over, our cleanliness, how, how clean we are, how dirty we are. And then also like if we just kind of gelled as friends overall. So I did talk to her for some bit and then we did mesh and have things in common on a base level as just friends. So I think that's good. I mean, you don't always have to be best friends with your roommate, but if you at least have some like sort of yeah, friendship, definitely. acquaintanceship, it's really good for that, so. Mm -hmm. As well as also like, maybe kind of like deal breakers in terms like if your roommate smokes yeah, or does definitely. drugs. Or, or if they're like always coming home drunk. Yeah. And, cause I did hear about that, like people would come home drunk, turn mm -hmm. on all the lights, they make a lot of noise, right. the other roommates trying to sleep and it's very right. like disrespectful. Mm -hmm. I think just being transparent, if you have those issues already and like just vocalizing those to like potential roommates and them doing the same to you. Um, I think just any transparency in terms of that is super important. Um, luckily for me, me and my roommate, I mean, she didn't do any drugs. So like that wasn't an issue, but if she did, then we would come up with like boundaries in terms of when she could smoke, where she could smoke and just talk about those things as well as like with drinking and stuff. Open communication on when you're coming into the space, when you're leaving the space, yeah. especially when you have like classes or when you just want to chill or when you want to bring friends over into your room is super, super important. And um, I think, yeah, just the open communication of expectations and boundaries will lead you to have a good <laughs> roommate experience. If you are, I would say even like, if you're like pre-choosing and trying to find a roommate or once you receive a roommate, cause maybe you decide to go like the random selection route, having those conversations is super important as well. Definitely, and I would say also a good thing to do is just do little small acts of kindness for each other. Mm -hmm. Like me and my roommate, we would just like buy each other a donut from Dunkin' and just leave it on each other's bed or like, oh hey, I brought you a brownie from the cafeteria. Like it's super yeah. simple, but it makes a big difference in just you know creating that sense of like love and trust between you guys yeah no i completely agree with that and that creates a really like nice sort of 
like living energy in your yeah. space. It's so. like the golden rule. <laughs> right. Do what you want done into you. <laughs> yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. What about you? What was your experience? Yeah, because it was so, completely different. <laughs> yeah, so. mine was different. Um, so I didn't find my roommate before. I just left it to random. And what happened is I was actually in a rehearsal and I got an email and I was like, oh, we found your roommate. And so it had her name and her email and that's basically all they tell you. So I reached out to her over her email and she was really excited that I talked to her and we started texting and she seemed super nice. And so the first time I actually met her, was in my dorm in Boston. It was good though, like it was a good random bit. She was really easy to live with, so I got pretty lucky in that way. And she was respectful and nice. And I think it is important that if you have differences, just to talk about it. And because I think both of us were very non-confrontational and nothing bad happened really, but it's good to talk about what's going on so another thing that they don't tell you like anything like so they just give you your name the name and the phone number or sorry the email and so we were talking and she did mention that she was also visually impaired which they didn't tell me about and so i was grateful that she kind of let me know in advance because i think it is important that if there are things that you know are gonna determine your living style that you let your roommate know but it worked out really well for us and it was definitely a new experience for me and i'm grateful that i had it so at berkeley there is rooms for singles doubles triples and i think quads but singles are extremely rare i haven't do you know anyone that has a single? Um, I think you have to like, if you have a disability or you have yeah. some sort of accommodation, you can go through like the Disability Resource Center and then talk to them and then that's how you can get like a private room. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way I know how. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, you can put on your preference form, your housing preference form, that you want a double or a triple, but really like it's up to the school and what they assign to you. Yeah, it's really random. Mm -hmm. Doubles, I think are most preferred. Uh, triples just seem to get really messy yeah. and chaotic and the rooms like, it's just, it's small living space for three people. Definitely. And I know a lot of people who have triples wish they had doubles, but if you do get one, and again, all the same rules apply, just yeah. talk about everything and be aware that there is some time to change who you're living with in the first few weeks or so. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that were doing a lot of changing. So if something happens and you don't feel comfortable where you're living, definitely let Berkeley know and they can try and accommodate you. Along with those lines, me and Monique lived in two different buildings. Um, that are offered. So I lived in 160 and that's like the newest building. It's like the main building on campus. That's where the CAF is. That's where like most of the recording studios are. They have the gym there and then practice rooms. And then it's just all dorms. And then Monique lived in 150. By the way, 150 and 160 are literally like buildings right across from each other. Yeah. So they're right next to each other. And they also have a few other dorm rooms, but I think it's safe to say 150 and 160 are the most preferred dorms. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about living in 150 is there are private bathrooms in every single dorm. So you get your own shower, your own toilet, your own sink. And in 60, they are shared for the floor. Yeah, yeah. There'll yeah. be like, there's like three showers. So in each floor, there'll be three showers and three toilets actually <laughs> for each floor. Um, but I never had a problem with like getting a shower when I wanted or going to the bathroom and like having a toilet available when I wanted. Um, there really was no issues with like overcrowdedness on my floor at least. Yeah. Um, but yeah. They seem pretty clean, right? Yeah, and they're really clean. They yeah. clean them like every morning and every night. So yeah, it's pretty good. I will say something I liked about 160 that 150 didn't have is just the overall brightness and feeling of the space. It's sort of more of an abstract thing, which is why I think it's not talked about as much. But like Yuzel said, 160 is newer and 150 is older. And 150 just has like darker carpeting, 
I think a lot less window light, at least in the dorm I was in. And so I did really like that 160 felt so bright and warm and welcoming, whereas 150 has kind of that cold lighting. <laughs> but I did love the private bathrooms and 150 also has washer machines and dryers on every single floor, whereas 160 is just on one floor. And then uh, 150 also has uh, practice rooms on every single floor and you'll almost never have a problem getting one. 160 is kind of different so there are times like when doing laundry that you need to like go and do laundry so it's not like busy so like I always went like midday on like a Wednesday um, or else they do get like really busy and then in terms of practice rooms yeah practice rooms are pretty much always full like every night um, it's hard to get a practice room in one, 160 so I always ended up going to like 150 or like making a reservation online to get a practice room. I will say like something that surprised me is 150 is part of the school, meaning that there are classrooms below us, next to us, and there's recording studios, all of that is the library in 150. And so on the one hand, it's kind of nice because you just wake up and five minutes later, you can be in your desk ready for class. So you don't have to waste time traveling. But on the other hand, it is different getting used to living in the same space that you're studying because there's no physical separation and therefore it can be a little bit hard to get yourself out of there mentally because I think it is important to have that break and have that space away from school where you can just relax and settle down. But when it's in the same physical space, yeah. it is a little bit harder to separate. Yeah, that's so true. I didn't realize the extent or like how huge 150 was. And there's like this on-running joke that people say that they get lost in like the catacombs <laughs> of like 150 because it literally is like, there's dorms and classrooms and recording studios and practice rooms. Yeah. And like, there's like newer, I feel like they put like new, there's parts of the buildings that are like, that is a little more renovated like the big ensemble rooms, but then there's like the older area. And I don't know, it's really confusing. You can get lost in there. So like- <laughs> They have maps though posted. Yeah. Like they will have maps posted on the hallways in like the lower part where it gets really confusing. Mm -hmm. So that's nice at least. <laughs> yeah, but I, I really liked like the vibe of 150 and how everything is there, the library's in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everything's like all accessible within one building, so that's nice. Oh, I will say another big difference is 150 feels a lot more closed off dorm-wise. So because there's your own private bathroom and there's also heavy doors that lock no matter what, um, people don't really know each other on their floor. At least that was my experience. It wasn't very community feeling, whereas I feel like with 160, um, at least I think for, for your floor, everyone mm -hmm. kind of knew each other, mm -hmm. everyone was friends, they have like a lounge space for the floors, whereas with 150, I didn't really even know my neighbors, and so if you really like that community-oriented living style, then 160 might be a better choice for you. Yeah, I would agree, because like, because of the bathroom situation, you're always like, at least on my floor, and I think in general, you're always like running into people or like seeing people on the elevator because you're like going to the bathroom or going to the lounge or like, I think people are just like more outside of their dorm yeah. because of that than in 150 because obviously you go to your room, you have everything you need there. Um, but yeah, I did find, a, I, I found a lot of community in 160, but also that might've been because I made the effort, like I remember like the first week I would like knock on people's doors and like introduce myself and be like, hi, Ms. L, I'm your neighbor. Um, and that's how I made a lot of my friends. And so that's why I knew everyone. Yeah, I um, would definitely recommend doing that yeah. for sure. I did not do that. So I wish I did. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just depends on like who you are. That I'm like really, really extroverted. So that can be really nerve wracking to like kind of just throw yourself out there. But I think regardless, you're bound to meet them because of how the living space is. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, just things to think about. Yeah. Next question is, is tips for class selection and teachers? Um, when do you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so for your first semester, what they'll do is 
you'll have orientation week, which is a bunch of fun activities they have planned for you. And during that week, um, Berkeley will actually make your schedule for you. And your schedule is tailored to you based on your audition, uh, your test scores. So they have like ear training tests, music theory tests, that sort of a thing. And so that will place you into whichever harmony and ear training um, class that is best for you. Me and Yazelle were both had a lot of transfer credits mm -hmm. entering into Berkeley and so they will also take those into account and disperse those for you and it's really nice you can save a lot of money doing that so definitely, I highly recommend it. Definitely. And so yeah your uh, schedule is kind of made and tailored for you but when you get it if there's there will be like a two week period I think where it's called the ad drop period and in that time you'll be able to go to all your classes and if there is a teacher or a class that you just feel is not for you you don't vibe with the teacher i will say definitely change it because that's the only time you can and you're going to be stuck there for the whole semester and you're paying a lot of money to be there so yeah. make sure you love it because i know i think my first semester I was in a harmony class and I felt like they were going too slow and I felt like I knew all the material they were talking about. And so I found out a teacher was coming who was new that I was a big fan of because I had heard of him. And so I was really excited that he was going to be there. So I actually transferred into his class and that was a really good decision. So take advantage of the ad job period for sure. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I will say like, be prepared. It's gonna be frustrating because you don't get to choose anything. You don't get to choose the class, the class times you're in, the professors. Like I had friends with really wonky schedules where they had like a 6 p.m. class and it was like two hours. And it's just, it, sometimes it's just not convenient. Or I had friends that had classes like really early, as early as like seven in the morning. <laughs> So like be prepared to kind of be frustrated and like to get what you get, but there are things you can change. So like, um, I know from my theory class, I obviously I started off at Berkeley with like the most basic intro to like music theory. I didn't know really know anything prior. Um, and the class I was in was going way too fast. Um, and so I talked with the teacher and they were able to place me in a lower level, which I really was like all for cause I didn't want gaps and I didn't want, yeah. I, I wanted to know everything like from the very beginning. Um, so yeah, talk to your teachers, see if you can like switch in terms of like levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, Monique did that, I did that. Um, honestly, don't take no for an answer is my thing. <laughs> like a lot of people, I feel like the faculty might tell you that they can't do something when in reality they can. So just keep, mm -hmm. if you really want something, if you want a class change, um, if you want a time change, really push for it and like advocate for yourself. Um, yeah, I think the biggest difference between college and high school is that in college, everything is negotiable. Yeah. In high school, you get what you get and that's it. But yeah. in college, you can completely change mm -hmm. things if you want to, mm -hmm. which is cool. Yeah. And, the, and with Berkeley, I know there was like an issue with like, um, they didn't have enough spaces in certain classrooms or like the demand was really high for a certain class and you couldn't get in. So if you want something, act upon it the moment you like know about it because yeah. it, the, the chances are that you could be left with nothing. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's my tip for that. In terms of teachers, rate my professor was really good. Once you do get to second semester and you can pick your own schedule, that's gonna be really nice. Look for rate your professor and just like, that's like a website you can go in and put the professor's name and then students have reviewed the teacher. So you can go in and rate if they're like hard, if they're if they're kind, sometimes they're really not yeah. kind. Um, their teaching style, the amount of homework they give. Um, and that's how I chose all my classes. Yeah. Based on rate my professor. And I will say, definitely talk to your academic advisor often. Like I would say two to three times per semester at least mm -hmm. because they're going to be such a valuable asset for you to have in regards to what requirements you need to take, um, mm -hmm. what electives you should keep in mind if you're considering certain majors and all of that good stuff just to make sure you're still on track for graduation. I agree. Like if you network well with like your professors and with like the advisor, if there's an issue that comes up, they know people within the school and they could advocate for you. So like, that's 
and also, also like another thing to consider that you can help you or give you tips that you might not know about. Yeah. And yeah. definitely, yeah, talk Especially to other students. Especially if they students. work there. Yeah. Talk to other students about what classes they liked and disliked because there's a lot of classes I didn't even know existed until I talked to some people. And right. Now I'm considering taking them. Right. So. And you'll hear things like your friends will talk. Yeah. Upperclassmen will also talk and you'll, you'll get to know it. Uh, preparing to be on your own is a really big thing. It's kind of a culture shock, not gonna lie, especially if you are like leaving your home and like for the first time and you've never lived away from your family. One of the biggest tips I would say is like, call your family. Like, I mean, you can call your, I call, I'm really close to my mom. So I, I talk to my mom like every day and that helped me feel more grounded and like I wasn't as alone. And there is a learning curve to kind of figuring out who you are and your place at Berkeley. Just because you're around so many amazing musicians I mean, I come from like suburban Utah, so the city was definitely like a change and how kind of fast paced everything is and the way people think, like it's really inspiring to be there because everyone is always thinking much bigger than themselves. Yeah. Um, and so that's really awesome, but you can kind of get lost in all of that. So do things that make you feel grounded, that make you feel good. Self-care is really important. Take care of your mental health yeah, and definitely. put boundaries for yourself and for other people. So you just feel good and make sure that you're that you're okay. Yeah, I really just talked a lot with my friends and family from home. Um, I know for me, like I'm a Christian, so I like reading scripture was really important for me. Praying for me is really important. Um, and that helped me, helped me keep me grounded within feeling alone, living in this new place. Mm. So yeah, do things that make you feel good and that make you feel at peace and at home and i think that will be the best bet in sort of navigating your navigating your way as you like live in this new place because yeah. you don't you won't know anyone you'll get there and you'll know literally no one but the good thing about it is that you'll find your people and when you do that'll even like make it better so yeah, yeah. Yazelle actually reached out to me on Instagram because she saw that we were from the same place. Mm -hmm. And so definitely reach out to people, get to know them as much as you can. Mm -hmm. I think we'll talk more about that on my channel, mm -hmm. but it's really important for sure. Yeah. Um, I will say speaking about like things you can do before you get to Berkeley to prepare for that is I would recommend know how to use, you know, your debit card, know how to use your That's credit true. card, know, you know, how you're gonna do those adult things, mm -hmm. know how to do your own laundry, mm -hmm. um, figure out, you know, can I, you dry this or not? I know, like, I was always in the laundry room, like, calling my mom, like, can I put this in? <laughs> and, Same, honestly. Yeah, um, just you know, make sure that you're an easy person to live with, clean up after yourself, mm -hmm. don't be a slob. Yeah. <laughs> in terms like in the living situation, cause you'll also be not, you'll be living with your roommate, but also you're basically living with like hundreds of other kids in the same building. Yeah. Um, and th that are also living on their own. And so they're also trying to navigate things. And so, so we're gonna be talking about things about that Berkeley that we didn't like. We'll talk about things we did like over on Monique's <laughs> channel. Um, but just like with anything, I know before I got to Berkeley, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a dream. Everything's gonna be perfect. I'm gonna be living in Victorious. I don't know if you've seen that show. <laughs> like Victorious from Nickelodeon. I was like so hyped and sometimes things aren't the way they seem. Um, Berkeley is definitely not perfect. It's an institu institution that wants to make money off of you. <laughs> so like, <laughs> um, there are things that like don't make sense. I didn't like, and a lot of people don't know this, but the classrooms are literally so outdated. <laughs> like, like I remember my roommate sent me a video of like her classroom flooding. And like, oh, yeah, flooding was a big problem. Yeah. There. I, like, it happens a lot. And that was in 150. 160, I didn't really have issues with the building because it's newer, but like 150, like, I don't know. There's just things like the paint is chipping off the yeah. walls. There's like music stands that are rusting. Um, the desks are just like old, they don't work. 
Like, yeah. I don't know. It, yeah, it's because they put all the money into, like, nice recording we, equipment yeah. and studios. So... Yeah. I, I personally think that they should invest a lot more within, like, the classrooms because they do look like they're falling apart, in my opinion. Mm. Like, I would say the classrooms at my community college are way nicer than the classroom <laughs> at Berkeley. Um, but that's just kind of what you get. So... There are pros and cons. I mean, I guess our money is allocated. I don't know why they don't update that. Um, but yeah, I just didn't really love that about the classrooms. And like a lot of the, I guess like the projector screen sometimes didn't work. Mm, okay. um, they just weren't as up to date. And I, and I felt kind of like, okay, well I'm paying so much money like they should be. Mm -hmm. We should have what we need in the classrooms. The speakers should work, the projectors should work. Um, I don't know, that's how I felt. Yeah, what'd you feel? It is true, Berkeley is trying to make money off of you, and so they will charge you for everything, textbooks, um, every kind of fee they can pick up, tickets, mm -hmm. everything. Oh, okay, I want to talk about the ensembles, because I was frankly a little disappointed <laughs> with their ensemble quality. Um, I come from a place where, like, Musically, my musical background, ensembles are really, really highly regarded. And so, you know, to be in the best ensemble is something to shoot for. And there is such a thing as the best ensemble. And they're really high quality. The director's amazing. You're gonna have people who are invested, people who know their stuff, people who have auditioned to get in. But the ensemble quality at Berkeley is very disorganized. There's a lot of weird instrumentation there will be like six vocalists and no bassist in the band mm -hmm. things like yeah. that I know that too and so you know you'll be in a jazz combo group and the drummer has never played jazz before which is fine but maybe that should be for a group where no one has played jazz before and they're all trying to learn it not with someone who's very experienced in jazz and someone who has no experience, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I didn't like how disorganized their ensembles were and I wish that they were just a little higher quality, higher standards. Luckily in my second semester, I was with a really great professor and that made a really big difference, definitely. But just be aware of that and know that the ensembles aren't necessarily Berkeley's strong suit and most of the best bands that come out of there are ones that are student formed and done after class hours. True. <laughs> I agree with everything she said. Um, yeah, I definitely, as a vocalist, I was like in an ensemble where it was like six or seven vocalists. We had like a drummer and then a guitarist but wasn't even guitar principal it probably was just like a vocalist that like could play guitar because yeah. we didn't have a guitarist um i think at some point i don't know if that's like lack of like planning on their part mm. i i really don't know what the issue is with that i know they were all like that um yeah. but for my first semester like that introduction of that was not Mm -hmm. was not it <laughs> <laughs> um also i i know like for vocalists you will also take rhythm i think it's called rhythm and groove or it's something about like writing a lead sheet like if you don't know how to write a lead sheet they'll put you in that and you'll learn how to write a lead sheet and then you'll be able to play with like an actual band and then they'll provide like like the band the band that does come in will be like professional like they'll be students that like the school hires to play in those ensembles. There's 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 that class and then there's like of course the other ensembles like I think I was in like pop and R and B. Um and all of that is based on like your ratings audition. So the ratings audition is basically just uh, another audition that will help place you in an ensemble that's at your level um, so depending on your rating is like the ensemble you get put in and you yeah. don't get to choose that first semester i know there was like a lot of bad management in terms of like how that went about last fall i had friends that didn't get their ensemble like didn't get placed in an ensemble till like the second month 
yeah. of first semester. It was pretty bad. <laughs> like that was so bad. And like you're like paying money for this. Mm -hmm. So like they yeah, were Yeah, one like one credit hour, which is what an ensemble is, is over a thousand dollars. Yeah. And you've missed all those weeks. And you missed all those weeks just because some something is happening in the way they're managing that and placing students with registration. I don't know, but yeah, there's mishaps that happen and like be prepared for that. Because I know a lot of people were frustrated because they, they're they not getting their money's worth Yeah. for that. That's why I draw a period. Which is like, unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this kind of comes with like the social aspect of things. I did not like how some people just thought they were better than you just because. Oh. <laughs> like yeah. there's a lot there. You will encounter a lot of cockiness mm -hmm, and ego definitely. and a lot of clout chasing. And my advice is stay humble, work hard, and just let that speak for itself. Because all these flashy people, you'll see a lot of people will try to flex. Yeah, that and those, fall on their face. Those, those like first few months, they'll try to flex and think they're better than you, whatever. Don't fall for that, don't play into that. Stay true to who you are. I mean, you encounter that everywhere, but like in music school where like everyone wants to be the center of attention and they are the center of attention for the most part in their hometowns and then come here, like we'll come to Boston and are like kind of faced <laughs> with everyone else. Like you'll just yeah. see a lot of fakeness. Um, but for the most part, everyone's really, really nice. Yeah. I've met some of my best friends, the best musicians, people that are super like easy to work with, humble. And um, it's really awesome. Just stay out of that kind of vanity because yeah. it does exist and it can be very intoxicating if you get involved in it. So. And people who have that really large ego are hard to teach and you'll see teachers getting frustrated with those students. Yeah. And if you aren't there to learn, you know, what are you there for? You're not there to show off. You're there to become a better musician. Exactly. So. Well, we're going to talk about things we <laughs> did like because there are a lot more things we did like we do love about yes. Berkeley, <laughs> but that'll be on her channel and we'll talk about that. And then I think last one's any regrets. Okay. Any regrets in terms of Berkeley? I have no regrets, actually. <laughs> yeah. Do you? <laughs> I, <laughs> think, I think. I'll let you start. I'll, I'll think about it. As okay. <laughs> well, I think that I do kind of regret. I last year was just a weird year for me because a lot happened in my personal life and everything else. But I do wish that I practiced more, actually. <laughs> I, I wish I practiced more because I didn't have a lot of time to, but at the same time, I was also prioritizing my mental health. So that's not a bad thing necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And I do wish that I talked to strangers more and people I didn't know and try to make better friends. Um, Cause it's important to have friends when you're going through that experience for sure that are there with you physically. Because I had a lot of friends at home, but um, I think it's important, because you'll meet a lot of new people, you'll have a lot of conversations, but the most important thing is following up with them. Follow up, meet again, because that second time is where you're gonna start forming that connection. And so, I think that's what I'd say. Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of regrets, now I do think about it. I think, but I think that's of everyone. I wish I would have like performed a lot more. Mm -hmm. I think because I was there and kind of going through the motions and everything happens all at once, right? You're like socially trying to be okay. You're like, it's a lot of new learning curves in terms of like academics and new things you're learning, um, how to navigate, like just being in the city. Um, it, I think I just, I don't think I got distracted. I think I just, because of like, I was tr in this stage of like trying to figure out who I was and like where I, where my place was and all of that, I, I just didn't really focus that much on performing. And so I wish I would have just put myself a little bit more out there, but it's not like I didn't, I didn't get to perform, but yeah, I, I say that, that would be like the only thing. Keep in mind, you do things as things come and like just be patient with yourself like sometimes like you were saying like with your mental health like maybe you wanted to be a little more social but like you were also yeah. dealing with other things that are just as valid so i don't know take it as it comes i also wish i would have done a lot more sightseeing 
I feel like oh, okay. I feel like I did sightsee Boston, but I feel like there was a point where I did get trapped into this like. Yeah. People talk about it where like it's the Berkeley bubble where you literally don't leave mm -hmm. like campus. And I feel like for some time I just like didn't leave the area I was in. Like I just stayed in Back Bay. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of students have that and they don't leave. Like I talked to people and I was like, have you been to the North End? Have you been to Seaport? Have you been to Cambridge? And they were like, no. So at <laughs> least I left, like I did yeah. leave. Um, but yeah. At first I thought you said sight singing. Oh, sight singing. <laughs> oh no, sight seeing. Yes. Anyways, we're gonna end this video here. Thank you so much for watching. If there's any comments you have or any questions in specifics that you want us to elaborate on that we talked about in this video, just leave a comment down below or like you can message me on Instagram. I'm sure, are you okay with people messaging yeah, you definitely on can. Instagram? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be in and out of both of our videos on both channels. So if you have a specific question, just make sure to write like at Monique, at Yazelle <laughs> um, in the comments down below. And yeah, I hope this was really helpful if you are thinking about coming to Berkeley or planning to come to Berkeley. I know this video would have been so big and like amazing for me to yeah. see before I got there. So yeah, I hope this was helpful. Make sure to check out part two on Monique's channel. And yeah, we will see you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>